This is the first of the history podcasts for North and South. Uh, I'm here with my dad, Des, who's going to be telling us about growing up in Bootle in um, the 50s and 60s and uh, different things about his life. So first of all, uh, Dad, your name's Desmond. When were you born? 29th of January, 1947. 1947. And uh, where were you born? Uh, Chestnut Grove, at home, 18 Chestnut Grove. So you were born just before the NHS was set up? I was also born on the coldest day for many, many years. It's only got past and the big freeze, uh, the beast from the east, I think, the other year. Anyway. So it it only got surpassed fairly recently for our Yeah, it was was the record for the coldest day, yeah. Um, When it comes to... Being born at home, obviously that's unusual today unless people really want it. But um, was that normal for people at the time well, before the NHS? I was the youngest of four, so yeah, it was just taken as red. Right. Yeah. So when you were growing up, what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my dad worked on the docks. He was a stevedore docker. And my mother was a, a housewife, a mum, full-time mother. Did she ever have a job when you were young? Or? Not that I, not while I was born, no. Okay. Now, in terms of a stevedore, today it's all kind of uh, done with containers and um, computers and the, the systems. What was the job that a stevedore did? He was actually loading the ship. He was actually stowing the cargo in the hold of the ship. And everything was actually handballed, you know, like sacks. You used to have a hook. Every docker had a hook on the belt. And some days they were, when they were dealing with sacks and stuff, he dragged the sacks and a lot, there was a lot of handballing, but also lifting and stowing and stuff like that. It was a heavy, dirty job, you know, dangerous stuff. What do you mean by handballing? You should have Physically, yeah, yeah, physically throwing cargo because the stuff would be lower down the hold. Yeah. And they'd have to take it off the nets or whatever it was and put it in all the corners of the ship, you know, yeah. and le- 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 level it up. Was it a, a the, the work in Liverpool was often quite casual, wasn't it? Because it was a port. Yeah. What, what, how, how was your dad affected by that? Was there no work some days? Oh, or? yeah, he used to sign on some days. I mean, every, every day they're going on the pen. Yeah. To stand, actually, sorry, twice a day, morning and afternoon. Yeah. I think if you got a job, you didn't have to go on the pen, but you didn't. You got you go on the pen or the job ended. And the thing about it was, was that there was sometimes when days ago, weeks ago, when they all signed on. There was no ships, no work. So when you mean on the pen, what, what, what do you mean oh, by the, that the, Yes, the pen was actually the, the sort of the big shed where they all used to go and they used to put the books in <clears throat> and the ganger would take your book. If you took the book off, yeah, you'd all hang your book up. If you took your book off, you were on and then you go into the ship and whatever. And if you didn't get taken off... Oh, you, you were, were left, you were left, yeah. You, but just, you would then sign on. For... Yeah, you sign, it was a sort of what they call signing on. I think yeah. there was a fallback pay, I forget what it was, it was buttons, you know. So was that done through the Labour Exchange, the dock? No, or... it was actually, they were down, it was the, the National Dock Labour Board, I think, at the time. It was yeah. a sort of national sort of organisation, you know. So that, that would have been better than what it would have been like for the dockers. Well, mind you, my granddad was a docker in... Um, before the war as well, but you know, like a uh, hundred years ago, you were talking about real casual labour. Yeah, it was improvements. probably better, more organised. Well, yeah. don't forget, we just come through a war. I'm talking about. I was only born for it. Yeah. But up until then, uh, that was, I mean, that didn't change until about 1966 with a thing called the Devlin Report. Yeah. So my dad actually only for the last few years of his working life. Yeah. Actually, had yeah, a secure well, a, a job, a secure job. Right. Yeah. Um, but everyone else was in the same boat, mm. dockers. Mm. I mean, there was tradesmen, like boilermakers and people ancillary working on the docks. They had full-time jobs working for, you know, people who'd served the time and specialist yeah. jobs, people in the opposite. But the actual dock labourers, the Stephen or labourers, that, they were casual, you know, most of them. Um, where mm. did my nan and granddad meet? I did think you... it was, uh, Mary told me, it was at the Sun Hall. Right. Which was a picture house on Stanley Road. And that's a film theatre, like a, yeah, a film, cinema. Yeah, movies, yeah, yeah, the Sun Hall, yeah, yeah. So they met there. Um, what was your kind of home like? I mean, when you were growing up, you lived in a house just off Marsh Lane in yeah. Bootle, near the docks. 
um, working class area, but what were the houses like? What, what can you remember from your house? Well, you actually, the, the housing stock where I was wasn't bad. I mean, we had, we, I lived in a terrace of about 12 houses facing a school, a school which was built in the 30s, uh, next to an older school, uh, which was next to St. James's Church. And the bottom of the stu- uh, Chestnut Grove, there were huge houses, big houses, off to the left, all the odd numbers, where my cousins lived. They had big gardens and everything. And they were quite nice, substantial houses. But on the other side, on the other side of the church, there was three little streets, Formby, Kirby and Speak Place, and they were very, like, tiny to up and down and stuff like that. And a few of them had no running water in the houses in Speak Place. And so, there, was, there was also a bond, the, what they used to call the, the, the debris, but if we didn't realise, we were using French words, that, which was a bomb site. They used to call it the Debbie, the Debris, and it was debris. Yeah. Right, yeah. So you still had some bomb damage when you were growing up? Yeah, I remember, even as a kid, I can remember a big old uh, army truck, an American army truck going round. Um, it would be round all over the place, you'd see it. And I'd say to my older brother, what's, what's that? He'd say, oh, that's the bomb damage. And they were still uh, patching up houses and chimneys and stuff like that, you know. And this is this is like into oh, well, the 50s, I was, I was 60s? Born, yeah, so no, 50, no, 50s, like 50s. No, no, no. About 53, 54, maybe. Oh. Maybe um, 55, yeah. So th- th- there was a mix of different housing down there, but some of it had no running water, not right. even like... Cold water. Yeah, well, no, we had well, we only had cold water in our house. We didn't have hot water, right? But we had a, a tap and we had a whatever. So, the, what what would happen is your mother, I take it, would use that tap get water and then would you heat well, up one of them big stoves? Or? Yeah, you have to hold boom, boom. and some of them used to use the fire. You have a grate. You had a fire grate. Yeah, and in the fire grate there was like an oven. So when Mary cooked the meal, if my dad wasn't coming in for seven o'clock or whatever. The meal would be cooked for us about five or six, and she put my dad's dinner in the oven. Now, the oven was a grate, yeah. uh, and a grate next to the fire, and the fire was always kept going. So th- the fire would be on, the oven was literally just next, next to it? Next to it, yeah, it was a, a, like a, I forget what metal it was, it was all black, but it was a grate, everyone had them, it was a grate, and every kitchen you had a grate. Did, did you have a bathroom, or did you have to get a bath out? Uh, no, I had to get a bath out. We did have a bathroom, but there was no hot water in it. So, did you have a bath up there? If it, would, it, would that be topped up with like water from downstairs? Or? Uh, no, yeah, no. If yeah, we if we had to get a hot bath, well, d- d- but don't forget, we only had gas. Yeah, and so it was a bit of a job taking hot water upstairs. Yeah. So as kids, we never actually got a bath at home. Yeah. We'd get washed in the back kitchen. Yeah, and every uh, Saturday we'd go to the public baths and get a, a bath. So when we say, when I was young, you'd go to the bats to go swimming? No, we, we used to go, well, you we used to go back to swimming. Yeah. But we'd also go to the bats. Uh, and in Marsh Lane, right, just round the corner by Salisbury Road, you know. That was actually originally a swimming bats, but it was bombed. Yeah. So the slipper bats, you used to call them the slipper bats, were still left. And that's where we'd go and get a, get a bath. I forget how much. And it was. you'd go once a week? So. Yeah, about once a week, Saturday or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It was really and- that was what lots of people did. Lots they of people did it. Everyone did it. Yeah, you just did it. You just did it. You did that it. was just what, what people yeah. did. Like yeah. people yeah. go to the shop. Or yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah. It was just the norm. Really. Yeah. Uh, it's hard for us to imagine that. I mean, I remember when we got central heating put in in the eighties. How cold were winters when you were freezing? We used to have the dad used to have all army did mob coats, army coats. We had back. We used to also have like army blankets, rough yeah. things. But in the winter, you put the coats on the bed. I can remember getting up mornings and the actual, there was frost on the inside, your condensation, your breathing yeah. or whatever. It was actually, there was frost on the inside of the uh, thing. It was freezing. It was cold. Absolutely cold, yeah. Do you know what you said? You'd put your coats on the, on the bed. Is that where bed clothes come from? Because it was like clothes on the bed. Or... I don't know about that. No, it was just, these were all army coats. Because, you know, all the lads got demobbed after the war. There was a, a surface of army <laughs> gear. And so what people used to use them for blankets. Yeah. On top of the bed, you know. Yeah. So... Would you have that? Was the living room where everyone would spend their time? Yeah, the yeah, you'd all be together by the fire. That's right. And did, yeah. did you have a telly when you were young? No, no, television? that was 1958, 1959. We got our first time. But did you have a wireless or radio? Yeah, we used to all listen to the wireless, yeah. yeah. So, in a, in a winter's day, if it was dark, cold, yeah. or whatever, we're all in one room. You'd all be in one room. Yeah, and I've only one open the door to go down at the yard to go to the toilet. So outside toilet, by the way, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't all say, shut that! <laughs> <laughs> what about. Um, 
Like, did you have a yard? I know you might have Yeah, we had a narrow, a narrow yard, yeah. And Mary, it was sad, actually, <laughs> because she was a country woman, loved, you know, the seasons and stuff like that. But the lads on the lad, they whitewashed the, the walls. And we actually dug off the backyard up. I think there's pictures of this. And she used to plant all kinds of flowers. But God help her, like, the sun would come up at the morning uh, in the east, so she got a bit of sunlight, yeah. and then good till about most probably two in the afternoon, because it was like very uh, high walled, it was a back end, she what we used to call a jigger, and then the sun had moved round, so really it didn't get much sun at all, but she used to grow all kinds of stuff there. I used to love geraniums and lupins, and all, all things of bright colours, yeah. and when you think back, what it was, it obviously brightened the life up, you know. Yeah. The wall was whitewashed, yeah. Did, um... My nan was born in Ireland, wasn't yeah, she? Yeah. And she came over in, was it the 30s, 35? I think it was the 30s. I like Frank, I'll actually have done the dates, yeah. Yeah, I'll, spe I'll speak to your, your brother about that uh, from my nan's angle, but do you think it was hard for her coming over here? I mean, was Ireland was poor, wasn't it? So Well, at the time, after yeah, after 1922 and all that, well, there was nowhere else to go. She wanted to go to the States originally, yeah. to her brother. But then, of course, the time she was when she wrote to him in the 30s, after 1929 and all that, must have been, I don't know what year So the Wall Street wrote. crash was in yeah. 1929. But he himself, they, all the, the Irish people, uh, the lads anyway, in, in uh, New York and stuff, he was in New York at the time, and he told her not to come, that he said to her, the truth is, he said, we're all going to soup kitchens and stuff like that, you see. Yeah. And she went, oh, so he then, then, then said, so really, coming over here was a, a default, actually. She, she didn't want to actually come uh, to England, so. Um, that's fascinating. I mean, I, I, I want to speak to your brother about the Ireland, Irish stuff. I know he, he kind of uh, um, is big on that and, you know, the family history and the family tree. But when I was young, I remember going to my nan's and she died in 85. Your dad died in 82. Yeah. My auntie Nora, who was my nan's sister, died in 94. That's right. Um, I remember going to their house and they spoke with an Irish accent. And to me... I didn't realise that was an Irish accent. Um, now, people here with Irish sound and surnames in Liverpool, Roman Catholic, it's 50% Roman Catholic Liverpool because of the Irish oh, influence. Okay. They don't have a direct Irish... No, there's no do. link, no. Well, as I did, I, well, my yeah, When Irish. I went to school, I'd be in school with kids called O'Sullivan, uh, Flannery, O'Shaughnessy, McGraw. They were all Irish names. The yeah. teacher was named McC 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 McCain, right? Or McGovern, all his names, you know. And non thing that didn't know they were Irish. Yeah. They had no Irish connection. Yeah. They but were like, the, the Ireland was alien to them. It was yeah, just, yeah. the fact that they were all Catholic, but that they never had a direct link. Yeah. Because like, I used to, you know, my mother was like, and I'd sort of just say so and so, but none of them had ever been to Ireland, didn't yeah. have any. They're, there was one or two, I remember an Irish kid come to school, and I was talking about Dublin and that, but all the other kids, like, he was alien, he was foreign. Yeah. yeah. They didn't think they were Irish. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Because when you're a kid, when you're young, you yeah. just kind of t accept yeah. it. I think I'm trying to think of uh, Paddy McGlade. Paddy McGlade, actually, he was an Irish man. He was a teacher. And he said to them, Flannery and stuff like that, he said, you're all Andy. were saying, no, we're not saying. He said, yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. And it was quite interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, what was... Uh, we still have a little bit of, you know... Catholic Protestant identity in Sectarian. Liverpool today, sectarianism, but it, it's not what it was. I know, no, no, no. I know Liverpool was one of the last major cities mm -hmm. to get a Labour MP because people used to vote on religious, religious in the 20th century. But what was your experience of like Catholicism, Protestantism yeah. when you were young? Um, it was tribal. There was there was very few Protestants around, like the Webley family in the next street were. Yeah, uh, were and you knew they were Protestants. Oh, they were, and they were actually uh, virulent orange. They mm -hmm. were like in your face, you know. Yeah. They were like, and I suppose it was a reaction to what was around them. Yeah. But um, the the point was, it was uh, the whole thing was sectarian. But we didn't realize we were living in a sort of Catholic enclave, you know. Yeah. And we just thought that was the norm, but mm -hmm. it wasn't actually. Because once you then went out when you started playing football for the school and you'd play like St. George of England, yeah. Protestants, Balliol, Balliol yeah. was Protestant. Now all the others like the Winnies, the Jones, the, the Monikers, the, the Jimmies, right? Yeah. All the Bosch. They were all, all you know, yeah. Catholic. So there was this, it was like Celtic and Rangers. Yeah. And I remember one teacher, <clears throat> Mr. Fay, 
He used to say to us basically, kick crap out of these, you know, and it, and it was that kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you see any tension between the communities, like real tension? Or oh, was it more yeah, um, it was usually on the 12th. And what it was, the, That's the, the, the Orange Order, July, yeah, the Orange Order, the Orange Order yeah. would come to Seaforth, yeah. and they'd all assemble from the day in Southport, and after them were drunk and all that. Yeah. And then they'd march up the Lineker Road, right, and along to Stanley Road. Yeah. And one of my <laughs> uh, longest of memories, and it was quite funny actually, was we were all, as young lads, say, well, probably 11, 12, we're, we're getting aware of all this. There was a huge crowd used to wait at the top of the lane by where the Salvation Army, by where Little is now, yeah. and the Salvation Army, all the Bootle Police should be there, you know. Because yeah. Bootle Police Force was separate then, or there was another thing. And it was a very localised thing, and there'd be just thousands waiting for them. And that was all the Catholics from the lane coming up to shout abuse at them and the rest of it, you know. Now, some of them, they would have some support, would come down the hill, you know, like from yeah. around... Uh, the Oral Way and stuff like that, you know, the more established. So there was tension there. But I always remember he always played the bagpipes and the fives and stuff like that. But there was one fellow, and I remember he had a big drum made and he was banging the drum. Now, as he got to say Lineker Road by the, you know, by the banks, they'd stop playing and he just like, boom, boom, to just keep pace, boom, mm. boom. And he would do that for about the last about a quarter of a mile till he sort of got up just before the lane. And then the fella in the front, He'd have this thing on you know, the stick, the, the, the drum major. He'd throw it up in the air, right, as they do in Belfast and places, and then he'd catch it and he'd swear and all the prods would go, whoa, you know, and then he'd turn around and he'd shout, this is the lion, lads, and he'd go, let's give it to them. And every drum and pipe <laughs> and everything, and then, of course, the crowd, by this time, they're all, it's a frenzy. I remember one year throwing stuff, and one of the Webleys was actually King Billy on the horse, and all they were doing, they had bricks, and that was nasty, you know, throwing stuff at them. And, but funny enough, they always got through, and it was like, yeah. but it was, it was tension. Some of it, like you say, it was good fun, actually, but it wasn't. So there was a lot of nastiness there, you know what I mean? So the yeah. 12th of July, that commemorated uh, King the Battle Williams, of the Boys, 1690, the, yeah. When the Protestants defeated the Catholics in Northern Ireland. Yeah, just, it, was, it was this, it was that. Yeah, and it's yeah, a commemoration yeah. of that. And yeah. um, the Orange Lodge, particularly in Liverpool, it was kind well, of an identity thing well, that was, we are Protestants. If you think you about it, exactly. And of course, the lane was full of Catholic people with so Irish trying names. To and that, that was the whole point, yeah. yeah. And, you know, this is the thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Um, what was the community like when you were young? You know, to people say today, people don't talk to the neighbours. What was... What was it like when you were young in terms of the neighbours, your street, yeah. the community? It was very strong because if you think about it, the, the, you know, no one had any money. There was, there was very little, you know, people that had bikes, kids, and to give everyone a go on a bike, mm. you know, you shared everything really. There was a, it was a gang thing. You got, you, what was your local, you built a bonfire and you'd stop other people from stealing. That's what we used to steal the wood from different places, you know. They'd steal their bummy, they'd come and steal when the, the big lads were away. You know, it was all messed up. It was very tribal. But saying it, there was also the community thing of all the people together. And yeah. the older people and the older the older kids. And like the older kids in the families used to look after the younger kids. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the elderly people always lived in the house. I remember like the lane, the sorry, Chester Grove was full of little old people down the bottom. Hmm. And they all lived with, you know, families, with the, with their own families, you know what I mean? Hmm. It was, I don't think there was any isolation then, really. Hmm. And then people, they were all in the same boat. Everyone knew everyone and shared everything, really. Do, do you know, like, pe people have bigger families then, didn't they? Didn't, did people share bedrooms? Or? Oh, I think so. Yeah, well, I always say, we always had, I, I was always in with Frank. Uh, we never had my own bedroom, so yeah. it was, no, there was none of that. And you had, you yeah. were one of four brothers, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. Um, and it was only when like they got married, like well, Nora was actually in where Tom and Terry were, so she took their room. So we even like till we got married, I was sleeping with Frank. You know, mm. we shared a bedroom, and we didn't have separate beds. Mm. Just you know, that's just the way it was. Yeah, just, yeah didn't know any better, any different. It's interesting, you know, people today would think. You know, it's a big issue when you get your own room, your privacy, but no, it was, it's, yeah. a, it's a choice today for, for many people, but it wasn't back then. No. Um, what was the, the, the kind of working class culture, lifestyle thing, 
you know, how did you get meaning in your lives? What were the daily rituals or routines, the weekend things that you yeah. did? Yeah. How did you, what, what did you do for entertainment or for distraction? Yeah, well, most of it, I think, was, you'd say that the likes of football was always a big thing, you know. Mm. Uh, but really, it was the culture was mainly around the lane, drinking culture. Don't forget mm. there was how many pubs. Yeah. It was high density, all of them streets. Yeah. And you're talking about before the masonettes were built, so you had all yeah. about Little Wales, Bangor Street, and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge density of population. And there was pubs, like you say about Scotland Road, on the lane was sort of, there's what, five, six pubs, if you think about it, six pubs around yeah. the lane. Around the, and so the, the culture all meant the, the boozer, you know. And that was the thing, you were brought up your teenage years, the thing, big thing was going for a pint, you know. And you got like at 16, if you could get saved, then, you know, some. And, I'm just trying to think the one in Earlham Road where we used to go, that was our first one, the Moncaster. You know, always got served in the monkey, you see. You know. What, you know, like going to the pub, did, did you do that, like, was that a daily thing or just a yeah, weekend? Yeah, uh, when you say, you'd meet up once you're that age, once you're teenage and stuff. You wouldn't go every night, but generally, yeah, you, if you had any money, a few bob, you know, I'm going to say a pint was, I forget, I don't think how much a pint was two bob or something and you know you get around with a, with a quid you know six people in the round or stuff you think not they're doing five or six pints you know mm. like that but um and they'd have a jukebox and you'd listen to the mm. some sound to that music in them but basically it was the culture was boozed really um what was it like on a saturday did you did you play football when you were young did when you? i was yeah when i left school and that, i, I actually uh, always played football at school but uh yeah i was in we were in the jock i was yeah. in the under 21 league with english masters with christy mack and a few of us played we probably well, we played i played till i was in my 20s in the yeah. job but yeah football was it playing it was an integral part again of, of your life. It was, you know, Saturday afternoon. And was that Saturday afternoon? Saturday afternoon. You'd often work Saturday morning. Oh, Saturday afternoon. morning, and then you'd, yeah, go for it. We used to go for a drink before we used to go to the game, and then after the game, we'd go for three, but it was one of them, you know. Yeah. Just on that, I mean, sometimes you play football, but did you used to go and watch Everton? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, with like, like games and things, or, yeah. you know, sometimes the match was rained off, yeah. with adult pleasure and stuff, and you'd all jump on the bus and go to Goodison, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it was just one of the things you did, yeah. Um, did you say that you went to a f the first floodlit game at Goodison? I think or? so. I think it was Dunfermline. I remember yeah. going, I think it was a friendly with Dunfermline. I don't even forget what year it was, but, you know, that was like a, a, something a little bit different. I remember when floodlights were introduced, the ground, yeah. you were four big pylons, like big towers at the corner of the ground, not like they are now. Yeah. yeah. Um, did, did you say, like, fellas used to hang around on the corners as well? Because you right. never had TV and yeah, stuff, Yeah, that's where you? you'd meet. You'd go out and all stand on the corner and talk. And so if you're walking down the lane or, you know, Hawthorne Road or whatever, there'd be places where the, the people are just sort of congregating and talking. You know? And then you'd go somewhere else or just chat sometimes? Yeah, no, or... just chat for you because it was, that's, that's what you did, you know. Yeah, you just talk, yeah. How important was the radio in people's lives back then? Well, I think, for, well, I would like you, but I remember uh, the older brothers, they were always going, you know, like, I think it was um, War of the Worlds and, uh, you know, the Martians and I remember, like, certain uh, programmes used to get everyone going where the streets had just empty at nine o'clock because uh, War of the Worlds was on or whatever it was, you know, some of the sky fight type stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Quarter mass or something. The, the whole place had... Because they were all older than me, you see. I was young. And everyone had just, and we'd all listen, we'd listen to it, yeah. yeah. Do you know um, the the pub, like the, the, the ale wasn't that expensive no. compared to today, but how much was it to go to the football? Uh, even then, now the football, we used to get a boys' pen for a tanner. How much that tanner? Sixpence, sorry. Sixpence. Sixpence, yeah, uh, for a shilling. In all money. And that didn't seem like any real amount at the time. Cause, no, it was... I mean, a, if you go to the match today, you know, you're... Oh, yeah, that's no, it's, 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 there's no comparison, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But even to go on the ground, I remember, like Gladys and stuff like that, I, I'm not sure, I think it was like one and six or something. Yeah. But the, the thing is, you go, sometimes you go there, and there was a big queue, and you say, oh, we'll just jump in the boys' pen. So you'd sort of like stoop down and go, well, you've got to leave yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, how important was Sundays? There was a tradition of like wearing your Sunday best, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. the people go to church. I was a Sunday back then. Well, that was the thing. Yeah, there was the the going to mass on the Sunday with the gear on. Yeah, and um, again, you know, yeah, those was, was the Sunday dinner. The, the men would go to the booze while the women cooked the dinner. Hmm. Come back about two o'clock. 
the dads and then good old wait for that dads like that's what most of them did. I that he, he wasn't like that. He'd go the odd time, but he he'd be, be around and but Mary would have a big roast mm. and that'd be the thing, you know, Sunday afternoon, like everyone would be around the table with the big roast. That that was the communal thing, the family thing, it was all together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um in terms of school, I mean actually before I come to school, just in terms of like politically, you know, today working class people are as likely to vote, say, conservative as middle class people. Class is less of a factor in terms of how people might vote today. I know voting's only one part of it all, but what were people like in terms of the, the politics, their identity um, uh, when you were growing up? Well, I think when you mentioned before about sectarianism, <clears throat> we had uh, Simon Mann was the MP, was a Catholic. Yeah. And he made great play that he was a Catholic and also that he was from the lane. Mm. And there was a big loyalty thing. So I think a lot of people would vote sectarian. It was actually, you voted for Simon Mann because he was a Catholic, you know what I mean? Mm. I think a lot of prods, Protestants, sorry, they voted uh, for the Conservatives because there was a big, quite a big Conservative vote, even in Bootle. I remember talking to my mother years ago with the Bootle Times, looking at the results and thinking, I think one time, so it must have been about, what, 1960-something, and there was like 15,000 people in, in, in Boodle for voting Tory. And I'm like, what? But then as she said, well, people in Oddle, where we are now up here, the Klondike, you know, yeah. there were certain places like enclaves, it was very similar yeah. to if you think of Northern Ireland. I didn't realise it had gone on into the into Yeah, your it, it, was, well. it was there, it was yeah. still, you know, yeah, till, till the, the um, slum clearance, yeah. You know, that broke it all up. You know, it was a it was a physical and geographical thing that broke them up. As you were growing up, um, say by the sixties, what was the importance of um trade unions and the labour movement? Did was that something that you saw and knew about? That well, to us so it was, because we were brought up with that. My yeah. dad was in the Blue Union, yeah. which was a, like a breakaway of the T and G. Yeah. That was the uh, National Association of Stevedores and something. They had, yeah. in fact, their office was down the lane. Yeah. And the ones who were in the blue yeah. were actually seen as, like, I don't know, sort of uh, secessionist break away from the TNG. Yeah. And um, it was all politics in that respect, working class politics and the unions was, was always there. And most people actually adhere to it. But most people actually realised it was Labour, trade unions. They were the people who protected you and defended your rights and whatever, you know. So it was actually a natural thing to do. I remember the sea, the seamen strike and the docker strike. I think it was that about 66. Yeah. Although, no, I'm thinking of one earlier because I was at school, I think. And everyone was on strike. The whole area was on strike. Mm. And in the shops, you, you get sick. They wouldn't, you know, everyone was in the same boat. Yeah. So, so you that means they'd say you pay me yeah, later. Yeah, pay me later. Break a record. I mean. And with the shop supporters the support of well, the Of course you would. Yeah. yeah. So there was that, you know, integral thing, which was quite strange. Yeah. Did do you think there was a a feeling that everyone was in it together? Yeah. Back yeah. then, more so than say today. Yeah. Well, it was a post-war thing as well. Yeah. So a lot of people would have very strong memories of the war. Yeah. Like queuing up. Yeah. Uh, Russian and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, you didn't realise, I'm a kid born in 47, so by the time I'm like sort of 10, but all, everyone that older than me but has lived through all of that. Yeah. And so that was, you know, a strong part of their identity. Yeah. And I, I would come in at the tail end and I'd, I'd hear them all talking about this stuff. But there was that thing of togetherness, yeah. yeah. Was, to what extent was there a kind of social mobility? Did that, is that something that you noticed, the idea of, people being able to better themselves and prove themselves? No, it, it really was, I had a cousin, Madeleine McShane, um, and she went to Seafield and Crosby Grammar School, right? And so I'm talking, I don't know, I must have been about, what, 12, 11. Um, Madeleine was a uh, pastor as a nurse. She used to work in Sefton General, right there on a bike, and she had a sort of posh accent, so she thought, she thought she was too good for the lane. I remember that all for him, Jack. Um, then she she used to go with a fella. He was actually an officer on a, a ship, the Hobart Star. Uh, this is Rouch, yeah, his brother. Yeah. And this lad, he was a fourth engineer on the ship. I don't remember he had a duffel coat on that he come down very you know, And then she moved on, moved down. She actually went to Australia eventually, but she went to live in Dunstable in Bedfordshire once they were married. Yeah. But she always had the thing like it wasn't good enough for her. 
Yeah, you know, and, and that was, you know, you know, that was interesting, yeah. But that was my first sort of uh, incident of awareness that people were, you know, saying that. And then uh, the lads were all then, the, the better lads were sort of a little more uh, astute, were starting to serve the time and thing. Yeah. And people would say there'd be that little debate. Well, you know, you can get a job on on the on the uh, the bread vans or in the tire place or doing this or do and you get more money than saving your time. But then the others would say, yeah, but when you save your time, you come out with a so trade. Saving your time is the idea. You stay at a place, yeah, yeah, you get trained up, yeah, yeah, yeah. you have an apprenticeship, yeah. and then at the end, you, you're skilled and you can yeah, take yeah, that yeah, into yeah, other things, yeah. and that allows you to earn more. Yeah, and most of them once they actually serve the time. Most of them moved on then. Yeah. They never stayed in that place where you served your time. Mm. You would go off then. You'd like a journeyman, you know. Yeah. Do, was social mobility a thing though by the late sixties? Oh, 70s? by the late sixties, I think. Yeah, there was. There was definitely. A, well, the first generation I remember who started talking about buying houses or whatever. That most probably happened. To, well, to my uh, recollection, would be around like sort of the mid sixties, sixty five, sixty six, yeah. stuff like that. Um, that you could send people and say, Oh, they bought a house, you know, yeah. in Crosby or a house in so yeah, and you go, Oh, hang on, yeah. And and there was that kind of thing to it, you know. Well, yeah. that's what my own brother did, Frank. He went through because you know, yeah, he, he went like he got married. What did, when did he get married? What 69 or something? I don't know, 70. And he actually moved into a, a new house, yeah. But well, he, you know, that, that generation started to actually acquire, you know, sort of uh, mortgages and that. Before that time, when you were really young, what was it like economically after the war? Like you still had rationing until the early 50s, didn't you? Mm. Um, that was fresh in people's minds. But what was day-to-day economic reality like in a, in a household? Well, I think it was always tough. I mean, you knew there was, there was never any surplus money. Yeah. And um, the doctor didn't earn that much, right? And I remember actually going for me to the family allowance with my mother down to the post office down the bottom of the lane. And I think it was on a Tuesday, and I think she used to get six and nine. I think it was six and nine. And then coming home, she'd call it to Horan's, which is now by where the Sully pub is, and a little fella in there, and she'd buy, be a, you know, a lollipop or something. And whatever. Now, they, they were reliant on, she was reliant on that six bob. Six and nine, six bob pound nine. Six, six. that's six, six shillings. Which is six shilling and uh, nine. Today, like 30 pence today, isn't it? 35, 40 p. It's like, it's less than 10 bob, less than, you know, mm. it was coppers. <clears throat> and, um, but they were, everyone was reliant on that. And where did you go to get that? The post office. That was family allowance. And that was even if you had people working, etc. Uh, well, I think, yeah, but by the time I was going there, no, the, the lads were also in school and they were all mm. in secondary school and stuff like that. Um, were people happy? Like, were uh, people happy in their day to day lives? Do you I think? think so. You made the most of it. I, yeah. I, my recollections of like when I think about people, I don't think of anything somber or you know people miserable and moaning. You know what I mean? Hmm. I think people just got on. With, I know there was that they did. I think they did laugh at adversity. You know, hmm. I don't think it was necessarily black humour as well. Hmm. But people they made their own fun and they laughed at things. You know what I mean? Hmm. You made your own fun on the street. You know, we used to play all kinds of street games and stuff like that. Mm. But um, I think at the time as well, uh, you, you weren't conscious like that we just had a war or you weren't conscious like about, I've never heard anyone talk about fascism or anything, mm. but there was a general sort of feeling that things were probably getting better, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you had something to wear to uh, Well, it seemed that way, or oh, subconscious. I mean, mm. it wasn't like, oh, where it was subconscious. Yeah. Just in terms of jobs then, I mean, obviously in Bootle, there was a lot of dock work, etc. Were there other alternatives? Were there other options? Or did that change as you got older? How did the jobs market kind of work? Yeah, well, if you think about the elder, one of my brothers, like, well, the first fella, Tom, he started serving his time in gardens, the printers. He was a book binder. Terry went to uh, Henry Booth, he started to serve his time as a joiner. Yeah. Uh, and then Frank, who was actually very good at art and reproduction stuff, and he got a job in Bemrose, which was very unusual. That was a, a well paid job. He was actually yeah. a, a, you know, a retoucher and stuff like that. And, and so the lads then were starting to serve the times in these trades, you know. Um, 
things like basically, you know, the joinery was a carpentry was a big thing, hmm. and you know, sort of. I don't remember anyone really going into plumbing and that. Uh, electricians again were, were seen as like they they were the doyen, they were the, the top notch. Um, I didn't personally know anyone who was an electrician, but electricians were seen to be a good That's job, you know, working for man web and stuff like that, yeah. To what extent, how were gender roles different? Because were women expected to stay home, to go into the workplace? How, well, how, what was the kind of difference between a man and a Yeah, a I'd woman? say so. Again, subconsciously, you didn't realise it, but, you know, your mum and all, all my mates, all their mothers all stayed at home. Like, well, they, they had... Kids, they just had kids. Mm. And don't forget, they used to have to wash by hand. Mm. Everything they did was like labour intensive. Mm. So, you know, it wasn't like sitting home watching the telly all day. It was, it was awful, to be honest. But we, we didn't know any better. Um, when the kids left school, the lads and they went for certain jobs. But the girls would work like um, the civil service, uh, the tax office, you know, yeah. some would go into nursing. Uh, this, this was the kind of... And, a lot of them would work in factories, yeah. right? Because there was quite a lot of factories around, you know, like a Williams Toffee factory. There was a nut factory down the bottom of the line. Pe people would work like the in manual till they got married, yeah. and then you know, they hopefully a few years once they started having children, then they did basically stop. But the girls who went to the, the the upper echelon would go to the tax office, yeah. uh, you know, or work in a job in Manweb and you know places like that. Yeah. Do you know um? the situation with with jobs for yourself i know you've had quite a few jobs so when you left school i mean uh, i'll mention school first because i know that like i know you you're intelligent and bright and yet you left school at 16. 15. 15 and i think today you would be identified as one of the more intelligent you know i'm a teacher and i, I know what you your intelligence is like and your writing skills etc how did that pan out for your school? What, what were your memories of school? And why do you think you didn't go on into, like, say, further education, looking back? Well, it wasn't really spelt out for us. It wasn't an option at the time. I left in 62. Yeah. I mean, I, my birthday was in January. I was 15 on the 29th of January, 62. I left school on, in April, the first half term. You then left school. Yeah. And I remember when we left school, there was no ceremony, no, like, whatever. Yeah. We just, the, the, the cohort of us, right, who were leaving, some of them were still, because their birthdays were until, yeah. right, it was it was quite harsh, actually. There was just about, I don't know, about 15 of us, so, so well, this is it, boys, like, uh, have you? Because for about three months before, the youth employment had been in such a year. And some of them had had jobs, you know, on, on the on the um, the bread vans and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And what do you want to be? They would ask you, what do you want to be? They gave it a little booklet, you know. Yeah. The booklet was called Prospects. Didn't know what it meant, but that was it. But really, that was it. And then the school, I remember Mr. Nolan was the teacher. And um, that was it, really. We just walked out of school. That was it. We said, all right, see you, boys. Like, you know, that, that was it. So your brother you know you, you did the 11 plus i know your brother went to st mary's didn't he like why didn't you because given well, what i said earlier when i did the 11 plus sister helen uh, sister um Cuthbert, there were six of us were sent up to st george of england we don't know why we yeah. never got to the bottom of it um i'll give you the names like yeah terry poby uh hamilton harris uh, that was three, four. There were six of us were actually sent up for some reason, I don't know why, to set the exam in St. George of England here, and not one of us passed. Right, okay. Did a lot of, you know, talk about that. I realise now, because I was in teaching and whatever, that basically it was a selection process, that it was nothing to do with that. That basically your face didn't fit or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, there's a book by a fella called Douglas the Holman. The school, yeah. You may have a textbook teacher yeah. come across it, yeah. Anyway, he writes in that he actually quotes Bootle. He said a fella says to him um, about you know chances of going on to grammar school, and he says, well, it's quite simple really. He said if you lived in somewhere in Cheltenham, right, and your child's just eleven plus, the f odds are your child will go to the local grammar school because the pass rate is something like sixty two percent. 
63%, okay? But as he said, if you live somewhere in Newcastle place, or in Bootle, Lancashire, in Bootle, Lancashire, the pass rate, I think, in the book is 5%. You know, like, people want to go back to that now. Some people want to go back to that. Maybe it would be better today. But, like, I, I just... That's just not fair, all right? You know, I just don't don't understand what it was supposed to do. I know, like, you, it's almost like where you were born, it was spelled out, like, here's what you're going to do because of where you're born yeah, and what yeah, your parents yeah. do. I mean, it just seems so wrong. Well, I'll, I'll give you something on that. When Nora and Sister Joan, right... She sat at 13 That's plus. my mum's sister. Yeah. Your mum's, yeah, your mum's sister. She was um, in St. Augustine's and there was one teacher there who had a few kids in the class, realised he had the spark, yeah? Mm. And so this teacher personally said to them, which was available, by the way, the 13 plus. We'd never heard of it, right? But this teacher said, you can do this 13 plus. So she got these kids and girls to do the 13 plus. And I think there was eight of them and they all passed with flying colours. She ended up in Marie Court then. Mm. She had to sort of catch up. She was also always, always under a question mark, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, okay, but then again, Joan was an affable type parent, mm. so people took to her, and mm. she persisted, and she made friends, and she, she got over it, you know what I mean? But she was the first, actually, mm. in the Clark family to actually break through. That's my mum's side. Yeah, if you look at um, Christine and Elizabeth, mm. Whatever they were bright people, they all never, none of them got the eleven plus. That's just awful. Well, I mean, well, looking be, back, I because mean, it's not a mer- it's not on your merits. It's it's again, it's socioeconomic. It, it's it's if you don't realise at the time, you're just a victim of it. You're yeah. like, yeah. It just seems so unfair that because I know it what, is you, unfair. what it is you were unfair. all like now. What what was school like the day to day reality? It of was school? good. It was like it was enjoyable. We um, did a lot of football, a lot of art. Uh, there was very little academic stuff. Paddy McGlade, I mentioned him before, an Irishman. I remember that in year eight of his now, second year. Yeah. He didn't have year eight, it was second year. And he said to us, right, okay, <clears throat> we're going to do this book here, Macbeth Shakespeare. Yeah. And he said, right, he said, and I'll make sure that you learn this and whatever. And I can still do soliloquies of Macbeth to the stage. <laughs> And it was horrible, like, moth book, you know what I mean? There was no pictures in it or nothing. But we'd sit there, and a bit like the catechism, we were used to this rope learning thing. And that was another thing. He actually taught you, drummed into you, the catechism, wrote. And when we were younger, like in, uh, not the infants, but the junior school, the priest would come in and question some foreign priest would come in, a strange priest from another parish, and he'd say, right, to check that we were up to, to scratch on the... Um, the, the uh, catechism. catechism and the teachers would like be on tender hooks if they were let down <laughs> <laughs> and we'd all be there God made me love the six commandments of the church but you know all that nonsense but anyway what Paddy did he actually taught us right to read we had to read and we'd enact it and stuff like that you know yeah. uh, it's just a dagger I see before me the handle to walk my hand come let me clutch it you know and there's another one I used to do with the kids when I was teaching years I'd say oh I'd say we're doing this crap Macbeth I'd say it's great that's it go, it's crap I'd say no it's not and I'd already gone to the book page 45 I said go to page 45 about 12 lines down and they go yeah and I'd say <clears throat> me thoughts I hear a bush cry sleep no more Macbeth doth murder sleep Innocent sleep, sleep that wraps up the rubble sleep of care. The death of each day is like the mouths are dropping. Go, are they sharing you? I said, I've read it. And he go, share no drop. <laughs> <laughs> so Paddy, like, yeah. <clears throat> and that, that was like, he was a bit of a character, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I, whatever good it did, I don't know. But there was no academic input, really. I mean, things like maths, I think, about long division was as far as we got. There was, there was no um, equations at all. It was too complex, you know. Lowest well, common it was deemed to be like, too complex for you. Like. Well, yeah, we'd sit in the class because it was like, you know, you couldn't have individual, you know what I mean? And, and they didn't have the resources, you know, yeah. Well, what jobs did you have? You've had quite a few jobs when you left school. What did yeah. you go into? Well, I went into the stationery and print department, first of all, in the co-op. Yeah. And I, I did that for a bit. And then um, I then actually went to work in a few small printers doing the... Lithographic lito yeah. stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah, till I was about 19. Then they got you know fed up with all that. I thought, oh, hang on. So then I, um, a lot of the lads, you know, like Eric Morrison and them, you know what I mean? Yeah, they were working on the building and stuff. 
would seem quite exciting, you know. And he always seemed to have a few bob to, to buy the, you know, the, the round with. So I did, you know, build and work as well, various firms and went round there and stuff like that. You built the strand, didn't you? Built the strand. I worked on the strand. Shopping centre, yeah. Centers, yeah. I was there about eight months, yeah, or maybe more, yeah. With, with Derek, with, with Owen Ryan, with a, a few of the mates, you know, colleagues and, yeah. And did you work on the, tr the trawlers? Or yeah, I went, on a, I went to yeah, a few trips on the trawlers. That was 1967 up to Fleetwood. Yeah. Just and you went round Iceland and oh, places right, like Iceland, that. Yeah, Baskin, Iceland, did you see Baskin sharks? I remember uh, telling yeah. me all uh, No, it was actually, uh, uh, what they call a Norway or something. They actually got caught in the net and the whole ship lanced over the trawler. Yeah. And the cook in Abedonia, and he was now into all this stuff. And he said, if you go out, she said, they've got something in the net there and check it out. And it was what they call a Norway. It was like a, a whale with like a bit of a... a Sus thing. Kind of yeah, thing, yeah. yeah. You, and it normally was unusual because like, they were the only concerned it was damaging the net. Yeah. You know, they didn't give it. There was no, you know, uh, conservation oh, crap or nothing yeah. like that. Yeah, but yeah. that was another thing that told me. You see, because the crew were all from Fleetwood, right? And they used to say to you, like, Greece and water don't mix. Hmm. They said, "What do you know?" Because the crew hated the engineers. Now there was three engineers. The the chief engineer was a Scotsman, Dallas Scott, never even spoke. And uh, there's two. Uh, hunt shows. One was a, uh, a Polish fellow called Stanislav, who came here with the free poles during yeah. the war. A uh, big man, big, big, hardly spoke English. And the other guy was an Irish fellow, Ulster man. He was basically drunk most of the time. So they were like taciturn. They never even spoke to three of them. Yeah. It's quite funny down in the engine room. And the engine room, the noise was incredible. I used to just go down to see how the engine works. You used to look at me, you know. And then, but the crew, the Fleetwood guys, they hated them. Right. And then the captain, his name was Richardson, Scratch Richardson, but he was married to a girl called Fonta Daly. There was like Italian families who did well in the yeah. skippers. And then they were all related, you see. So you had this hierarchy that the skippers and the boatswains and that were certain families. Yeah. And they'd be on the right, although they worked with different companies like Boston DFC or Wire Trawlers or whatever, they'd actually be on the blow to one another, you know. Hey Joe, we get over here, we're on fishing. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, there was Help a lot of dish, that. yeah. And so you'll, you'll, you'll go into that as a total stranger, you know, because he hated you, like Scouser yeah. anyway. But then you also realise, you know, this animosity. It was interesting, you know, the, the sociology of it, yeah. like the, the way it was sort of panned out. And yeah. the, the captain was nice. He, he, he was skipper, the captain, skipper. And... <clears throat> But um, he also showed me the Sean horse was, you know, the uh, the, the German, he said, actually, he said, where we're fishing now, he said, we've got to be careful, he said, see there, he said, there's actually Mark on the chart, there's on the wrecks and stuff, he'd show me stuff Jim like Bolton that. Jim Bolton, the water. Yeah, yeah, places, play, things of interest, yeah. yeah. Do you know, you, I think you've mentioned before that you could leave one job and get another oh, fairly yeah. quickly, even yeah. though it wasn't the best job you yeah. could walk into, but gotcha. you got a job in the post office and that was important at the time. How did that pan out? Was yeah, your dad well, happy with that? 1960, wait a minute, 68, I think. Yeah, um, after this like transient work, working on building sites and stuff for a few years, uh, I said, not a job, I'll be in the Echo, and I said, you know, postman, well, postman was seen as a career. Hmm. That was like a, a move up. Uh, I applied and said, okay, one of the things was a, a test medicals and all kinds of stuff. But one of them was actually a test. You had to go down to town to what they call staff office in Stanley Street. And we all just sat in the room and he just give you all this stuff, paper. And basically you were, you were looking at like which was right and wrong, just lists of addresses. And there was just be, it was before postcodes, but you, you, you had like SW15 mm. and stuff like Glasgow and London and, you know, want to be London, want to be Glasgow, and you had to differentiate, you know. <laughs> well, to be honest, I just thought it was a doddle. I just went through it, didn't think nothing of it. And then as we sat there, they called a few people out and basically said to the world, you know, you're not up to it, like, you know what I mean? They, yeah. just, they just disappeared. And so they said to us who were left, like the elite, laughing at uh, oh, you know, you could uh, go on to the next stage. Mm. So then I got off the bus at the top of the lane and I'm walking down. It was a Thursday and my dad was walking up by Marsh Lane Station. He go, used to go to the, the uh, main to have a drink with his mate called Parksy on a Thursday night the other time. He'd go for a bevy and he shouted, he went, oh, I went, all right. So he's on the other side of the road. He said, how did it go? I said, that was all right. I said, I'm through to the next one. I'm going, oh, he was made up. He said, oh, he said, you'll have a job for life there. So he made up. He said, and I could see him walking up the lane, shut. 
So yeah, brilliant. Yeah. But that, that was the worst scene at the time. It was like a good job. Because yeah. you were a civil servant as well, you know. Hmm. I got a certificate telling me I was a civil servant. Do you know where uh, you had? I remember when I was young, you had uh, some printing jobs, and I know that you said that the job was becoming increasingly de-skilled. Yeah. And you then went to uni mm. and uh, ultimately went into teaching, which yeah. you did for the last, was it 20? Oh, 20 odd years. 20 odd years of your life before, before you retired. But I always remember um, Von saying that, oh, your dad's had lots of jobs and you, you have got that kind of experience of having seen so many different things. Yeah. But, you know, I do, I do think it's interesting, but I know nowadays they say that there's no such thing as a job for life, but you literally experienced lots of different things, didn't mm. you? Which I think is is um, is interesting from a historical perspective, looking at this. But at the time as well, a lot of those jobs that you could just walk into, they, oh, yeah, they, were, they, were, they, they were just, uh, yeah. you just fill in the gap. It was you fill like, the gap, yeah. Yeah, yeah you yeah. just fill in the gap. It wasn't like conscious, you just, yeah. that's what people did. You were transient, you were, you know, yeah. expendable. Yeah. Do you know your brothers? You've already mentioned what some of the uh, what, what your brothers did, but what what do you remember your grandparents? Your um... no, I only the only grandparents I remember was Grand Short. <clears throat> That's my dad's mum, obviously. Um, uh, she died when she was eighty five, and I was I think it was fifty eight. I remember going to the funeral, but I always used to love Grand. She was a uh, a funny little woman, little glasses, like little sort of chubby. Looks like me. Funny enough, my dad looked like her, but she used to sit in the window of the house in Woodland Road, and which is Seaford, you know. Yeah. She, but at the time, you, she could look out into the river because hmm. uh, none of the docks was there, then none of the extension. And she watched all the shit, and she'd say when we used to go over Sunday or whatever, she'd say, "The Nova Scotia's in, Tom." To me, Dad, like you got a job tomorrow on the Nova Scotia, <laughs> and she'd sit there and watch all the. She knew all the ships, she knew everything. But she was a great personality, actually, a lovely woman. Yeah. I think just just going back slightly, you know, when you were in your house, was, did, did you see trees or greenery or no? No, that, 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 funny enough, funny enough, our street was the, one of the few streets in the lane that did have trees, yeah. um, and also we had the railway at the bottom an embankment. With a train, mm. like Southport train. So that, that was green you grass. See that, yeah. And there was a dinner hall as well, which had grass. And where the uh, Auntie Madeline lived and them big houses facing the church, they, were, they had trees. Yeah. And also the church had trees. So actually, all oh, oh, really, streets really, yeah. really was quite nice in, in that respect, you know. Do, do you know another thing? Um, did you say people used to go to school, um, you know, in terms of going the bats on a Saturday? What did school do for kids who had didn't have much about them? Or um, poor nothing or really. There was there was very little. I remember the, the incident you most probably recall was when um, Mr. Carney the head, yeah, and one or two other teachers. I remember there was, there was a few local women as well because I yeah. thought, what are they doing here? And they were in the the we had a cloakroom which no one used, but there was big sinks in there. Yeah, and what they were doing, they were washing clothes for the lads, you know. Yeah. And uh, what they did, they said to wash you up, you know, put your kit on, we didn't have a kit, a pair of shorts and a, you know, yeah. an old shirt, and go and play football in the yard. And what, what they were doing, they were actually, you know, cl washing yeah. the clothes for the kids and like, getting them shoes and that. We see, but there was a stigma, so they did it in a way so it wasn't stigmatised. Yeah. We just thought it was a, a gala day, went having a great laugh playing football, but actually behind it there was a, a social thing. Did, did lads used to wear wellies? You didn't see any barefoot kids at school. There was no barefoot, no, not in my days. But no. did you used to sometimes oh, wellies. Some of them wore wellies in the summer, yeah. yes, yes. Um, just look, putting that kind of stuff to one side and moving more up to the present, um, what do you think of being your greatest achievements in terms of, um, you know, what you look back on in life and go, you know, I'm proud of that. Um, the only thing I could say, and it was a bit, but most probably what Vaughn said, was I was versatile enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I, I, I worked in one place and I was only a, the new kid on the block and Clay Brothers, the day yeah. was a typesetter and whatever. Um, I was like number 42, I think. Yeah. I'd just gone in there, I'd only been there about six months eight months anyway they introduced computer yeah. typesetting and they said of course we had a very strong chapel there chapel union organization yeah. nga and they said oh no we're going to prioritize like it's seen the odyssey and yeah. the, the chapel said who goes for training we're like, mm. okay all right. um and of course i was right down the bottom and they picked the first two 
Anyway, the first lad, his name was Miggy, they call him Miggy Smith, he had a club foot, a nice lad, but he had a bit of a disability, you know, so he, he liked the keyboards and all that. And we used to do uh, the, the liner type, like for our newspapers, making yeah. rubber stamps. There was a lot of lino stuff, very physical, like a clockmaker yeah. actually made them. You know, they were actually intricate machinery, they were great actually. They used to make this chatter and noise like this machine, but then they were getting replaced by computers. So Miggy, has to go and learn the keyboard, QWERTY, yeah. and so they send them down to Sight and Sound in Liverpool. Yeah. Right? Basically, two weeks, learn the QWERTY keyboard. Next thing, I just get called in the office. Uh, oh, they sent two young lads, the two apprentices, actually. That was another thing we did, the union. We said, no, let the apprentices get on this as well. Yeah. So the two young apprentices started to do it, right? All right, I'll go with him. And then Sam, the man, he says to me, um, Okay, uh, I'd just like to put a proposition to you that I couldn't stand this for <laughs> So we smoke or not? He said, um, would, how, would you feel like, would you go to Salford and like do the machine or what? I said, yeah. He went, and anyway, what would you say? I said, yeah. He went, oh, he said, yeah. And he said, uh, go with Tommy. So I said, well, wait a minute. Well, you see, the thing was, when these things were brought in, yeah. no management was supposed to go on them. Yeah, yeah. So what all these weak people did, the old, oh, I'm not going it, I'm not going it, do, 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 comes right down to me. Yeah. I said, yeah, I'll go. And they said, but you go with Tommy. I said, I don't know, it's management. But what it was, they'd wave at it, you see. So, because the bottles had gone. So you had a bit of confidence and also a bit of versatility. I said, the, ver yeah. the confidence to say, oh, yeah, I'm gone, yeah. no. I'm getting paid two weeks to go to Salford. To learn do, do you remember we had a green car? Uh, yeah. Yeah, in that green car. I used to pick Tommy up in, in Kirby and he'd drive along the lengths and that. Lovely. I'll tell you what, it was the best two weeks of my life. And also the, the sight and sound. That was great. I had to tell with Tommy. I'm going out every day for that and all the expenses. And then I'm actually learning the new technology. Yeah. 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 Now I had to, so I do think back at that time because no one advised me. No one actually, you know. And I just, when that man said to me at the city, Sam, um, I'd like to make you a prophecy. And I said, yeah, anyway, you, 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 you. what? And I said, yeah. <laughs> he was made up. What do you, what do you think, uh, if you could live your life again, would you do anything differently? Um, no, not really. I mean, you know, I know to say, I'm out of cliche. Uh, because it's like everything else, you're not aware, are you? Yeah. You're socialised. Um <clears throat> That's right, hypothetical, really. But no, in as much as when I've made conscious decisions. That's know, something really. I get from you. I don't think you really regret things. You just no, learn from. I don't. It's like a mentality thing. But, you know, like in terms of achievements, what do you think you benefited from post-war compared to your parents? I mean, what oh, kind no, of things you could, did you... There was no, no, it was, it's parameters, isn't it? It's horizons, it's... They never even had a holiday. But what about the baby? Would you consider yourself a baby boom? Or were you, yeah. What, yeah, did, what I, did you see? What were you lucky for? Yeah, you I, well, I'm the most fortunate person that my generation, and me personally, I could I just like, okay. I, I've travelled around the world. I've been in airplanes, you know. I've, I've, traveled, I've been on cruises. I'm, I've gone to places. I always wanted to go, to, you know, to see um, Lenin. And I got there. I went to the Soviet Union when it existed. I've, uh, I went to Mao, I've, I've been to Mao's uh, mausoleum in Beijing, you know, I, I've been so fortunate that I've done the mm. things I wanted to see. I never thought I'd do that, I never thought I'd go on an aeroplane, I never thought I'd go on when I was a kid in the street. I know you've mentioned as well, like, you know, your generation didn't see the war, um, yeah. you know, you got married, you had, you had kids, you've, you've got a car, you bought a house in 71, I remember when you stopped. The, the mortgage cleared. No, seventy seven. We bought the house. Oh, did you? But, sorry, yeah, you got married in seventy one. And yeah. I, I remember when the mortgage cleared. You, and my mum, laughing and saying like we, we've paid it off, etc. But when your parents were young, did, did they have their own house? Did no, people? No, no, so, no. so that's something that was very much post war. Yeah, it's it's a very post war thing. Yeah. What, what what do you put that down to? The, the like the Labour Party after the war. Um, well, I think a lot of it, the actual social stuff is the, you know, the, the, the NHS, isn't it? And the Atlee government and stuff like that. Hmm. You could also argue, cynically, it's also down to capitalism. Well, it's post-war. And things did for a time, actually, because they had to regroup yeah. and get better. You know what I mean? 
uh, more materialistic, so you know, I was thinking, yeah. but in a way, yeah, that, that, that we were a part of that. You, you could argue as well that when things are getting better for people, you do think, well, things are getting better, yeah, yeah but it's yeah. when it's when it's not happening that you get crises. I mean, it can be intergenerational as well, but just putting that to, to one side, what have been just to finish. What do you think have been the biggest changes in your time? Because um, they say that the speed of change is just... Yeah. I mean, I remember the internet. You got into the internet very early on. You, you know, the way you said yeah. that you went along to that job and you said yeah. yes and you yeah. were other things. I remember when the internet got big in the late 90s, you were like all over it yeah. as, as someone who was getting on a bit. But what kind of changes have you seen in your time? What have been the big changes uh, in terms of maybe positives or negatives? Yeah. Um, no, I think... The positive bit is, is people basically materially seem to be better, you know. I yeah. mean, everyone's got a car, whether that's a good thing, I don't know. But, you know, that kind of thing, which might impress people. Um, the housing stock, I go around now on my bike and I look and everywhere looks great with trees and everything. There's, like, there's no slums, really. Mm. Um, you know, when I was a kid, there were, you know, awful mm. places, slums and back end trees and all that. So the housing stock, yeah. Mm. The actual thing that people are more materially better off, you know, people travel more, holidays, you know. The, the, but then I think a lot of it's a sort of escapism, isn't it? You know, it's like hen parties and stag but You know, you go downtown and see them all marching around with stupid uniforms on and all that. And you think, oh, you know, that's progressive. Okay. Uh, the thing of, I think that's been exploited now in this uh, pandemic is the fact that the economy is uh, the hospitality sector. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you think, well, like, when I was, no one works in factories anymore, which is a good thing, because that factory work, you know, it's like, no one works down the mines, thank God, yeah? yeah? But actually, what replaces them? So there's the negative things. Yeah. I think people are sort of aimless. I don't think they've got the certain... That's, that's yeah. why I think we have this this you no know, nationalistic, xenophobic thing. Is people are actually, although they have the military, the materialistic bit, but actually, they're not happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I do sense that. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think have been the negative things? I mean, you just alluded to one of them there, that, like, people don't feel, yeah. I don't know, maybe a sense of connection. But what do you think? You've said there that there's been huge material progress, even if they'll, even though people might not technically feel happier. Are there any things you've seen regress quite ba badly? And, you know, what what are your views on social mobility today? Or... Well, that, that's the thing that is regret. No, the fact that I never thought in my lifetime that I would see working-class kids having to pay nine grand a year for, uh, you know... University. For, for university and stuff. Pay. And also, like, the, the fact that <clears throat> they don't seem to do anything academic now. Yeah. Uh, they don't do anything for the sake of doing it. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's all this thing that, like, everything's jobs worth. It's yeah. really, and, you know, and, and, and things like that, you know. Mm. I always remember, like, Pontifex said one day, the jobs aren't invented that our children are going to... People don't invent jobs. They never have, they never will. You know, I was just say to the kids, why the McDonald's make burgers? How to go? I said, no, they make burgers to make money. You know that. You know what I mean? Mm. It, it's like, that a, to me is a big no-no. It's the fact that people are, well, materialistic and it, it's a thing about